<clears throat> okay, so welcome to chapter eight of Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. The title of this chapter is Meditation, Demystifying the Mystical, and Waves of Your Future. <laughs> so it's funny, the this much of my book is flat now, and this is just, yeah, <laughs> it's been it's well worn because I've I've really studied it <clears throat> getting there. Um, it brings us to page hmm, da -da -da. it's the end of part two and it brings us to page 215 so yeah 215 of about a 300 uh, page book no less than that <clears throat> so I'm getting there it's been a slog honestly um, to get through this but very rewarding for me because I've had several aha moments and I'm going to share one of those with you now and it's really just by learning and understanding it that you'll get those aha moments comment below if you get any aha moments whilst watching this uh, live or replay because it helps others right and and let's help each other to get as much as we can from this so share your aha moments share your breakthroughs um, the more that we as a team are in this together and help each other then that's going to inspire others and motivate others to say oh wow they're really getting a lot from it I should be more focused or I should really commit to doing it more um, consistently or for longer, etc. <clears throat> so um, now I forget what I was going to say, but I'll, I'll start by sharing the, oh yeah, I know what I was going to say because before going live, I'm recording this on Zoom. I was going to say something and I wanted it to be live. And yes, this is what I wanted to say. <laughs> Pause this. When you are um, when when you, when something is like, I'm not quite sure if I get that, or I really want to hear that again, pause, replay, really let it sink in. I mean, that's what I've been doing. I haven't obviously been listening. I've been reading it and going back over stuff. Um, these slides, I actually created them last night and I didn't share last night because I wanted to go through it again this morning with a fresh head. And because, you know, there's a lot of learning involved, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it to have this tool in your life will totally change your life. It's actually a very small time investment for the returns that you'll get on it. Okay, without further ado, haha, let me dive in. So here is a quote directly from chapter eight from Dr. Joe, and it's related to the subject of chapter eight. Why does it take such effort to let go of the external and go within? The brain in high beta can't easily shift gears into the imaginary realm of alpha. Our brainwave patterns keep us locked into all these elements of our outer world as if it's real. Now, I chose that quote because personally, and I know I'm not alone in this, sometimes it can really take me a while to tame the wild horse. And, you know, I'm, I get frustrated because I'm like, oh, here I go again. I've gone back into analysis instead of just observing my mind and going behind my thoughts. And um, this is why. This is why the brain in high beta, and I'm going to share with you in this chapter about the brain waves, the different brain waves, high beta, medium beta, low beta, and then you go into alpha, theta, delta, and if you're really lucky, someday into gamma. But it's not necessary to get the transformation by going that far. Already getting into alpha and um, eventually theta will be fantastic. By the way, I was always mixing up the brain waves in the past, and I came up with an acronym because I was saying, is it delta first or alpha or theta or so bat de <laughs> bat de. Uh, there's actually a Vietnamese restaurant in Geneva called Batat. So that kind of comes in my head too. So bat, beta, alpha, theta, delta, and then gamma. Anyway, I'll be sharing those in detail in this chapter. Just to remind you about what we learned in chapter seven, there is a gap. The chapter, the title for chapter seven was called The Gap. There is a gap between the person you truly are and the one you depict in the world. It takes a lot of energy to not be you. Use your powers of observation to help you unmemorize negative em emotional states, become a quantum observer to close that gap. Remember, Dr. Joe had two hands, the image of two hands in the book in chapter seven. When you unmemorize an emotion, you liberate energy. Remember the, the analogy he used was if you're driving a very long car journey and then you get out of the car to stretch your legs and breathe fresh air. It's like, ah, okay. Surrendering that emotion, the, those um, low level emotions to a greater mind allow you to close the gap. 
And I love that. That was a that was one of my breakthroughs in this book. It's like, oh yeah, I don't have to figure it out myself. I don't have to, you know, if I'm finding that I just can't seem to um, alchemize that negative thought, it's like, okay, God, help me out here. Surrender it. Surrender it to a greater mind. So I pray on it. To break the habit of being yourself, you need to become more observant by becoming more metacognitive. Metacognition, I think it was approximately chapter three that I talked about metacognition. So metacognition in a nutshell is um, thinking about your thoughts. So it's monitoring your thoughts, I have in brackets here. Embracing stillness or focusing more attention on your behaviors when you get triggered. So you're becoming an observer and becoming uh, with, with increased self-awareness. You've got to break your emotional bonds with the body, the environment, and time. What are the body and the environment and time? The big three. <laughs> you do this best through meditation. Meditation, its most desirable benefit is being able to access and enter the operating system of the subconscious mind. Remember, we've got the prefrontal cortex, we've got the midbrain, the limbic brain, and we've got the cerebellum behind. And the cerebellum is where the subconscious mind is housed. And our most desirable benefit is to be able to access and enter the operating system of the subconscious mind. Chapter eight is going to share the why of that. You're like, oh yeah, no, it makes sense. <laughs> In Tibetan language, it means to become familiar with the word meditation. To know thyself is to meditate, self-awareness. Dr. Joe uses the term meditation as a synonym for self-observation as well as self-development. To become familiar with anything, you have to observe it. You need to go from being a doer to a doer watcher. So you're watching what you're doing in your mind. <laughs> you have to observe yourself so precisely and vigilantly so that no unconscious thought, emotion or behavior go unnoticed. It's a real practice of observation. So that means that, you know, as soon as you become an observer, you're not in it anymore. It's like you're watching the movie on a television screen. You're not in the television acting a role. You're observing that. So you're releasing the Velcro, releasing the, the, the grip of uh, that story, whatever you're observing. Examples of how to change. If you want to become happy, the first step is to stop being unhappy. Seems a bit simplistic, doesn't it? But hey, it said it in the book. <laughs> Stop thinking the thoughts that make you unhappy. Stop feeling the emotions of pain, sorrow, and bitterness. So remember, we're chemically addicted to those negative thoughts. So catch yourself and go, okay, I really don't want to spend energy thinking about that right now, unless it serves some useful purpose to help resolve it so that you can um, uh, uh, raise your um, level of clarity and joy uh, or well-being, etc. But otherwise, just shift your focus. If you desire to become wealthy, stop doing the things that make you poor. If you want to be healthy, stop living an unhealthy lifestyle. That seems a bit like, huh, yeah, right, it's easier said than done. But stick with me, stick with Dr. Joe's book. If you consciously observe the old self, you are no longer being it. So our reality is based on our thinking and our behaviors. And if we accept this truth, then it makes sense to become, to raise our self-awareness to go, okay, if that's true, then what exactly am I thinking? You know, sometimes we're in denial about how dark our thoughts can get. And there's no judgment around this. It's information and awareness. Like, oh, I was thinking that, that like, huh, well, what would I like to be thinking instead? <laughs> You need to make the decision to stop being the old you in order to make room for the new personality. When you cultivate a new personality in meditation, the abundant yield you seek to create is a new reality. Contemplate a greater expression of self. Contemplation is a word Dr. Joe uses a, a lot in this chapter. If you are successful in consciously restraining those routine states of mind and body, then Nerve cells that no longer fire together, no longer wire together. Your brain literally changes. Ask yourself, what is a greater expression of myself that I would like to be? That's a beautiful question to ask yourself because in contemplating that question and thinking, okay, I'd like to be more, um, be less judgmental. I'd like to be more loving, more open-hearted. I'd like to understand people better. I'd like to be less impatient with myself and with others, you know, things like that. And just by even stating that you're putting your focus and your energy and your attention there, 
and those um, that affect your brain wiring. This contemplation process builds new neurological networks. Your brain literally changes. As you plan your actions, speculate on new possibilities, and dream of new states of mind and body, there will be a moment that the frontal lobe will turn on and lower the volume to the big three. And that's what we want to do, is just reduce the noise. And our frontal lobe takes care of that. It lowers the volume on time, body, and environment. It will appear to your brain that the new experience has already occurred. You will signal your genes in new ways and your body will begin to change. And for people that are having miraculous healings, that's what they're doing. In, in, I'm sh I just shared a testimonial about a 26-year-old um, a, a man, who I think he was 24 at the time, when he started his healing um, using Dr. Joe's work. He had uh, stage four brain cancer, brain tumor. And um, it's through signaling his genes in new ways that his body began to change. I really, really want to... Um, I want you to take this as a sign. If you're watching this or listening to this and there's a health condition that you're having difficulty in overcoming, really focus on, okay, I want to signal my genes in new ways. So what do I need to do? I need to increase my self-awareness through meditation. I need to look at my thoughts lovingly, not judgmentally, lovingly and um, with compassion and go, okay, okay that's the path I've been going down. And now I want to choose a new path, one of trust, one of joy, one of gratitude, one of love, one of abundance, you know, those elevated emotions. Did I just click the slide or not? <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd went on to the next slide, I wasn't sure. Okay, oh, here we go again, the picture's missing. Anyway, it's okay. The biological model of change. To break the habit of being yourself, you would be wise to select one trait, propensity, or characteristic and focus your attention on that single aspect. Yeah, I included this because I thought it was a small point he made, but I thought it's a good point because we're not going to be, it'll be overwhelming to change ourselves completely overnight. So, you know, look at one aspect. And, and then I remember Dr. Joe said he could choose one aspect and work on it for a month or a few months and then go on to the next one. It's like, okay, I'm not reacting like I was before and then move on, but it will have a domino effect. So he says, for example, if it's anger, when I feel angry, what are my thought patterns? What do I say to others and to myself? How do I act? What other emotions spring forth from my being angry? What does anger feel like in my body? How can I become conscious of what triggers my anger? And how can I change my reaction? So you're pruning, they refer to it as pruning, pruning away the old self when you do this. So again, it's self-awareness. It's getting to know yourself and coming out of the denial if you're believing, I don't have negative thoughts or whatever. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're not having that uh, belief, but in case, okay. So this picture definitely, yeah. That's an interesting bug that has appeared. Um, it's okay. Just read chapter eight, and uh, you'll um, you'll be able to. You will see. You'll see the all the diagrams there. Okay, brain waves. This is really the 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 meat of chapter eight. So these are the different frequencies that we experience when we are born, and babies when they're in the world, they're in delta waves from age zero to age two. And then from age two to five, they go into theta waves. Five to eight, they go into mainly alpha waves. And then beta, the analytical mind, which is beta, conscious thought, happens from age eight to 12 and onwards into adulthood. And gamma is an elevated state of consciousness. You know, the monks are, <laughs> are uh, a lot of them getting to gamma. So the, and then in the red box, I've shared the, you know, the cycles, it's, it's interesting. The, the, the brain is measured with something called an electroencephalograph. That's a really long word. <laughs> I find it interesting that Dr. Joe's company is called Encephalon. He doesn't mention that in that chapter by any means, but I just know his, because I've purchased several of his meditations and it comes from Encephalon Inc. So obviously that's where he took his company name from, an electroencephalograph. Cephalograph. <laughs> and that's what is used, EEG for short. And EEG is used to measure our brain waves. And what's very interesting, I'm going to be talking about coherence in this chapter. You know, they can measure are they 
coherent or are they all ziggy zaggy and you know different uh, at different speeds but this is how they they named all the different brain waves by the cycles per second that they have okay so high beta this one uh, he talks about a lot because remember uh, the quote at the start when you're in high beta it's impossible to get in, to access the subconscious mind. You're very much attached to the big three in high beta, and it's a very stressful way to be. High beta is short-term survival uh, mechanism, long-term stress and imbalance. Long-term stress. If you're in it in the long term, sorry, my, my slide didn't make sense there. If you're in high beta in the long term, you're going to experience stress and imbalance. The heart is impacted. Uh, arrhythmias, I think they're called, and high blood pressure are examples of how the heart is impacted. Digestion begins to fail. And immune function, you know, viruses, et cetera, you'd be more um, susceptible to them when you're in high beta a lot. Sustained high beta sends the brain into disorder and incoherence. And there's a, a diagram in that book with showing all the disorder from the EEG. It's like driving a car in first gear while stepping on the gas. That's what we're doing in high beta. And you can't think logically and, not, and, and um, clearly because all your energy is going for survival as if you're being chased by a saber-toothed tooth, tooth tiger. <laughs> so um, high beta in, for long periods of time produces an unhealthy cocktail of chemicals if you're in high beta for too long. And the outer world appears to me more real than the inner world in high beta. You're very much outward focused on survival. We're strongly focused on the big three in high beta, and it's hard to learn new, new information cannot enter. So I have a theory about this because I used to work with children with dyslexia and with learning differences. And I noticed, you know, the main reason that they improved when they were working with me is my theory is that their brain waves, you know, they were no longer as stressed. I was more of a therapist in some situations. I would help them to increase their confidence and feel good about themselves. You know, if they're feeling not good enough and they're in high stress state, um, remember in high beta, you can't learn. Yeah. So if you're having trouble concentrating on books, etc., if you're having trouble learning, get yourself, get your brain waves slowing down first through meditation. We can't open our minds beyond its narrow focus. So it's impossible to think of solutions because the brain is focused on survival. You want to have an open focused brain expanded. And that's why Dr. Joe in his meditations in his guided meditations to get the brain in that open focus. So we come down from high beta. There's, there is method to his madness. It sounds pretty mad. You know, he says like feel with his funny voice. Um, but that he, there's a, there's logic behind why he uses that voice because they measured people's responses to different sounds that he was using in different ways that he was speaking in those meditations. And they noticed the brain waves. Oh my God, people are going quicker down into alpha and theta when he would say things a certain way. And the reason is when you have a narrow focus, you're going to stay in high beta, you're stretched, but open focus. So it's like, feel the space around you, like, and feel it like, that there's infinite space, so go really far, you know, really, when, you, when you're meditating, like imagine that space, not something close by you, but expansion, because that's what helps your brain, you know, and at the start of a meditation, I'm all, I, I'm often like, it's very busy, my mind, and it gradually calms, it's the most beautiful feeling when you get that coherence that arrives, and the reason that's happening is your brain waves are slowing down and becoming more coherent. Okay. So um, the answer, the solution to high beta lies outside the emotions you are wrestling with and the thoughts you are overanalyzing because they keep you connected to your past. And actually, was it Kriva? Somebody mentioned yesterday, I had put a quote, you can't solve a problem from the same level of thinking that the problem arose. And that's a quote, <laughs> I've paraphrased it, but it's from Einstein. And it really is that, you know, in order to solve the problem, you've got to enter a, a different level of consciousness. And so really, re, you know, re, release yourself from the grip of the story and the emotion, calm down your mind and approach the problem from a different perspective. Solving your problems begins with getting beyond those familiar feelings. You must replace your scattered focus on the big three with a more orderly mode of thinking. What to avoid? You should avoid, I don't like using the words you should, but to get the most from your meditations, avoid stress about time or not enough time. Stress about your body. You know, if you catch your, 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 your mind saying, oh, oh, that 
I'm I'm fatter than that person or I don't know like and obsessing about that that's one of the big three so that's a like a red flag okay that's going to put me in high beta I don't want to go there I love my body I'm so grateful for my body and how it functions and I'm not gonna think too much about my body because I want to get beyond the big three body time and environment um or if you're stressing about the environment you're in etc just know that there's a stillness always available inside you no matter what environment that you're in. And that's what you want to connect with. Coherence. Okay. Let me see if I can bring up this picture. That's okay. I'm really sorry about this. I'm not sure which picture it is, uh, but it's not showing. Uh, <laughs> so in one of the pictures <laughs> in uh, chapter eight, the energy is orderly, organized, and rhythm rhythmic. Right. I remember this one. Actually, I can probably find it. Yes, it might be this one. <laughs> Let me bring it again. Oh, it's still not showing. Sorry, guys. Well, it's a picture of, it's a picture of um, a laser as opposed to a light. <clears throat> and the laser, hang on a second. Let me go back in presentation mode. Um, the laser is uh, very orderly. It's very orderly waves and the light is very dispersed waves. Okay, so the, if the energy patterns are chaotic, disintegrated and out of phase, an example of an incoherent, less powerful signal is the light from an incandescent light bulb. Yes. So the picture that's missing is an incandescent light bulb, as opposed to in the first picture, orderly, organized and rhythmic energy. Um, it's the light emitted by a laser. And what we want to aim for is those coherent waves of energy all moving in unison instead of the dispersed energy. And we do that by coming down or from beta and going into alpha. And how do we do that? Through awareness, not analysis. When you catch, and this was my aha moment. Sorry, I mentioned at the start about that I'm getting several aha moments. And I'm like, oh, so this morning I could catch it. Oh, I'm going into analysis. So it's okay to be aware. We're being aware and observing of our, our thoughts. Or I just like to not think at all if, when possible, but definitely not getting into analysis. And I love this distinction. This was new to me because it's not just thinking, not thinking. It's like, okay, awareness is okay, but analysis of those thoughts, that's where you go back into beta. The most fundamental purpose of meditation is to get beyond the analytical mind. You can't enter the subconscious mind in a state of analysis. And our goal is to enter that subconscious mind, the back of our brain. Awareness is necessary to become familiar with your thoughts. Awareness can exist outside of analysis. Now, I don't like the example he used. I'll share why in a moment. Let me first share the example. So he used an example of, I'm aware I'm feeling angry. So you're having awareness. Oh, there's anger arising. <laughs> I'm aware of it, but I'm not in the story of it, right? And in the story, analysis is, and he uses an example of um, your um very frustrated on a website. Why is this page taking so long to load? Who designed this stupid website? Why is it that whenever I'm in a hurry, like now when I'm trying to get a movie listing, the internet connection is so slow. So awareness is simply watching a thought and moving on. And analysis is the why and who and all of that. Um, so I, I don't think it was, it, it was, it's a good, well, maybe it's a good example because it's, he's talking about everyday life, but I would have preferred an example specifically in my meditation right? So in my meditation, this is not from the book, this is from the Eve, <laughs> so don't quote me, but I find this useful. If I'm in meditation and I notice what will happen, maybe I'll think about something somebody said, for example. And if I'm in awareness, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm noticing that that's bringing up anger, that there's anger there. Oh, interesting to notice. And then I try to move on with an open focus, um, you know, just leave that thought behind because I don't need to engage with it, right? Um, but if I was analyzing, I would go, why, why did she say that? What what was her motive behind that? What, uh, why is she trying to annoy me? <laughs> you know, that's analyzing it. And we want to stay away from that because we're going back into beta. So do you get that? Does, does that help? Is my example better than Dr. Joe's? <laughs> the difference between awareness and analysis. So it's observation versus engaging with it. Actually, I was listening to Eckhart Tolle this morning. Oh, fabulous. Uh, it was a workshop recording. Um, and he was talking about, you know, I can't remember the word he used about thoughts, but, you know, that they carry 
an energetic, well, as Dr. Joe would say as well, um, I wish I could remember it. I will remember and I'll share in, in a later <laughs> chapter. But, um, you know, all of these thoughts carry energy, right? We don't want to engage in energy that's kind of, that's going to bring us down, right? And we definitely don't want to analyze because we're going to be in beta and we want to get down to alpha. That is the goal. That is why I'm glad you are listening to this because you are understanding this and you will get um, a, much more from your meditations. They'll be much more powerful. So hooray. <laughs> the conscious and subconscious mind. So he has actually several pages and it's a, it was a little bit uh, heavy, those pages. He basically was talking about, let me see. Um, no, no. Right. I was trying to remember what, how much of it I shared. Uh, I, I didn't want to overload you here. Um, so when we're born, he shows from zero to two, there's nothing here. There's uh, There might be pluses and minuses. Um, yeah, but there's no, it's all subconscious mind from zero to two. This 5% at the top is conscious mind. It doesn't come in until age seven to 12. But um, let me just read below the figure eight, what he says. Uh, the total mind is made, this is after the, the, this is when you're an adult. This is the graph I took is when you're an adult because it gradually starts to the conscious mind uh, gradually comes in. But when you're born, it's just, you know, nothing. And then these pluses and minuses that are below in the subconscious mind, let me share what those are. Well, let Dr. Joe share it first and then I'll try and explain. So the total mind is made up of 5% conscious mind and 95% subconscious mind. The conscious mind primarily operates using logic and reasoning which gives rise to our will, faith, creative abilities, and intentions. That's just 5% of our mind, guys. The subconscious mind, 95%, comprises our myriad positive and negative identifications, which give rise to habits, behaviors, skills, and beliefs. Figure 8.1 illustrates the most fundamental purpose of medication. Med <laughs> meditation, sorry. Oh my God, it is like medication. It's a natural medication, meditation. Um, the, the most fundamental purpose of meditation presented uh, and in the arrow, presented represented by the arrow, to get beyond the analytical mind. We want to get beyond the analytical mind. That is the most fundamental purpose of meditation. That was new to me. It's like, oh, okay, I hadn't looked at it like that. Because the analytical mind is causing all the stress. It's beta, high beta. We want to get far away from there. That's where all our health problems are coming from and all our fears and worries about life. Get out of beta. <laughs> Think of me next time you catch yourself saying, get out of beta. <laughs> Nothing good happens there. Well, unless you're really in fight or flight and you have to survive. It's very rare in your life that that will happen. And then you need to be in high beta because you want all your energy to go to um, uh, survival and escaping. So um, what I did want to add to this was these pluses and minuses. So if the baby, as it's, it's learning, it makes associations. It learns, oh, I noticed just now that when I cried, I got picked up. Or when I cried, I got food. So that's a positive association it makes with crying. And then it starts to walk. And then it goes and touches a hot stove. And goes, oh my God, when I touch that stove, it's painful. Negative association with stove. So it stays away from the stove. And this is literally how all our associations are made in life. And we do not have an analytical mind before the age of seven. So everything that we receive, we take as, um, oh, that, as real. For example, that's why it's so easy. Have you ever wondered, oh my God, I, like I used to, like my children, how, how, can, how do they believe in Santa? And how did I believe in Santa? Well, you don't have an analytical mind. Then you start to go, hang on a minute. And between the ages of seven and 12, it's like this man traveling all over the world with the reindeers, hang on a minute. You start to analyze it, right? And then by the age of 12, it's like, yeah, there's just not a hope uh, of uh, continuing to get your child to believe in Santa because their brain has developed and they have that analytical mind. It does have uh, positive purposes as well, right? But the great thing is, that what we do is what we want to do is all of those beliefs uh, and behaviors that we learned and are in our subconscious mind and they don't serve us we want to go back in back into that subconscious mind so that we can create new associations so if for example you learned as a child that we really need to worry about money and we're always going to have stress about it you learned that, that was a, a mode of being right so that's going to stay in your subconscious mind. And how we do, what we do to reprogram our subconscious mind 
If we go back in through meditation, we've got to access the mind. We can only do it in alpha. We can't do it in beta. So we need to get beyond alpha and, and, and ideally down to bat, theta, ha, B-A-T, beta, alpha, theta, delta, gamma. Okay. And actually alpha can be in either. Alpha is uh, half in, in the conscious mind and half in subconscious. So you want to try and bring yourself down even further. So have more of an op open focus. And, and it just takes time. That's why, to be honest, if you're doing 15 minute meditations, it's a good introduction. It's great to um, have the consistent daily practice. But personally, I can't get there in 15 minutes. It takes me longer. Um, I trip out like I do 50 minutes every morning. The, the meditation that I do uh, every weekday, I absolutely love. It's Botech, Blessing of the Energy Centers. I do number three. Um, so um, the, on Dr. Joe's website, he sells meditations for, I mean, they're very reasonably priced for what they are, in my humble opinion. And the hmm, although Blessing of the Energy Centers 1, 2, and 3, I paid, I think, $75. And now I don't really listen to uh, 1 and 2 anymore. Because you have to start with 1, and then you listen to his explanations, and you say, okay, now I can go on to number 2, where you incorporate the signs. And then I went down to number 3, which is incorporating the breath at the start to open the pineal gland. So, but that's a process. So, personally, especially for health issues, I would... Um, I would do blessing of the energy centers. Now, I, I'm not working on any health issues. I mean, you know, well, I'll tell you something. I mean, I'm off sugar and alcohol, and I believe it's the morning meditations and visualizing that really healthy me. Um, it's it's uh, it's made it very easy for me. So uh, if you want to overcome any kind of dependencies um, or habits that you prefer not to have in your life, visualize them gone. <laughs> so um, that's just a side note. But I, I do Botech because I love it. I really trip out on it. Um, and I just love the the balancing the energy centers. And I just really feel in my body. At the weekend, I do longer meditations. I do, um, oh, I can't remember, uh, tuning into the energy of a new life or tuning into a new life, I think. And that's an hour and 17 minutes long. Or the other one I love is tuning into abundance. And that's a lot of opening the heart. So I do those on Saturday and Sunday. That seems to be my habit lately. Although I purchased two new ones at the weekend. One was um, boxes, the, the changing boxes meditation, the short version. And I also purchased, um, oh, the alchemist. Because interestingly, I, I feel like an alchemist. When I'm in the meditation and tripping out, I feel like I'm alchemizing my thoughts and alchemizing my reality. And then I noticed that he, Dr. Joe actually has a meditation called the alchemist. And I thought, oh, I just love that idea of uh, alchemy. So um, it's a nice one too. I haven't really... Did I do it on Sunday? I think I might have. I'm not sure, but I'll try it again this weekend. But it's nice to play with different ones. Now, the Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself meditations, I got them on Audible. They're available on Audible. Um, yeah, it's like it's kind of like a book. It's two meditations. Um, one is Water Rising. I can't remember the other one. I did them for a while, too. I mean, they're all wonderful. Anything that can get you down from beta to alpha to theta to delta. <laughs> Okay, meditation opens the door between the conscious and subconscious minds. We meditate to enter the operating system of the subconscious where all of those unwanted habits and behaviors reside. We need to change them to more productive modes of support to support us in our lives, right? So remember, all of those things that you learned as a child and beyond that, you know, those pluses and minus that are in your subconscious, you meditate to enter that. It's, we're like computers. We really are like machines. And... Um, all of those unwanted habits and behaviors reside. We want to we want to go back there. We get there through meditation. You've got to get past the analytical brainwave, beta brainwaves. You can consciously alter your brainwaves from that high frequency beta state to alpha and theta. You can train yourself to move up and down the scale of brainwaves. I mean, that's amazing. Imagine, and that's advanced students of, of Dr. Joe's work can. They can literally enter alpha, enter theta. And I mean, I guess I would have to have an EEG to know <laughs> because um, that... You know, I'd geek out on that. Oh my God, <laughs> I'm in alpha. It's like, uh, I, th I think that's amazing, you know, to get to that point. Okay, how to slow your brain waves. When you close your eyes, the input from the external world is reduced, apparently by 80%, because we don't have the visu visual stimuli anymore. In meditation, you transcend the feelings of the body. You are no longer at the mercy of your environment and you lose track of time. So the big three are no longer there. 
We want to get beyond the big three. The big three, if they're very present, we're in beta. The neocortex has less stimuli to work with, so it quietens down. So does analysis. Then you can drop into alpha, which is between the conscious and subconscious. As you become more experienced, you drop further down to dreamlike theta. I'll repeat that. As you become more experienced, you drop further down to dreamlike theta. That's why the more that you do this, guys, the better you'll get at it and the more you'll get from it. So it really is a great investment of time to learn it and to practice it um, on a daily basis. Coherence sets the stage for healing. Remember that picture that you didn't see of the laser having coherent waves, right? Coherence sets the stage for healing. When the brain is stressed, it's like an entire orchestra playing badly. Your job is to get beyond the big three, to become nobody, no thing, no time. And if you've heard Dr. Joe on his meditations, he says that, you know, in the guided meditations, he's, he invites you to become nobody, no thing, no time, right? beyond the big three. If you persist, the musical instruments will surrender to you and act as a team. In other words, your brain waves will become coherent. They won't be like, uh, they'll be coherent, right? And you're gonna feel that. And brain and heart coherence is when you're really vibing, <laughs> tripping. Um, he, he shares two lovely stories in this chapter. This is the first one, Jose's story. Now, Jose, this Jose this uh, told Dr. Joe this story, but it wasn't from Dr. Joe's meditations. I think it was before he met Dr. Joe, because it's not Dr. Joe's meditations that heal us, right? It's really, he's just a brilliant teacher and his meditations are brilliant at, at getting you past the beta down, alpha theta, but you can use another meditation as well. For my 30 day challenge, I'm inviting people just to focus on the Dr. Joe meditations, but maybe you might do another meditation and really feel that you're dropped down further. Um, you know, whatever, whatever works. So Jose did a meditation one night and got beyond his body. He focused on his breath and allowed his mind to expand beyond the barrier of his body. He went into an open, focused, expansive state. So he had had 10 olive-sized warts on his hand and the next morning his warts were all gone. I mean, that's quite miraculous. And he did it by getting beyond his body. And Monique's story, she, Monique was in a constant state of lag. Uh, their family didn't have money to send their son to the school he wanted to go to and debt was accumulating. They had actually $53,000 in debt. Monique made a conscious decision to change, to think greater than her reality. So she was at a Dr. Joe event I believe. And, um, and she, she, I guess she got it. She was like, oh my God, this works if you work it. So I'm going to work it. <laughs> she imagined herself as a woman who made her decisions with an abundance of time, an abundance of energy, an abundance of money. She created a new state of being, an abundant state. Remember, we talked about awareness of your thoughts. So really, you know, catch it. If you find yourself going into that, catch it. We're creating a new state of being here. Monique's goal to become this person was as firm as her vision was precise. It has to be a firm decision. She made definite plans for how her new self would think, feel, and behave. She won $53,000 on a lotto ticket. This was the exact amount of debt they had. And I just want to emphasize that part again. She, um, she made definite plans for how her new self would think, feel, and behave, but her firm decision. And this is so important. If you're like, oh, yeah, I'll try this out. Yeah, sounds interesting what Neve is saying. Yeah, let me give it a go. No, I mean, okay, go do that if you want, but you're not going to get the same results as if you decide, oh, I'm really going to go for this. I'm really going to make this firm decision. Her goal to become this person was as firm as her vision was precise. Have a precise vision of the person that you want to be and really commit to it. What you, the more you put into it, the more that you'll get out of it. So make it your top priority. It kind of makes sense. If you're saying, you're kidding yourself, if you're saying, oh, well, I just don't have time for it because I have to focus on this little thing over here that's gonna keep me in survival. It's like, no, right, if I really wanna change, then, then you've gotta uh, make it a priority. It's kind of like um, the Buddha that said, um, the people who say, I don't have time to meditate, they need to meditate double time because it's not the outside world that's gonna bring us our peace, our joy, our love, our connection, our abundance. It's inside of us. Okay, so make a strong decision. And there is another 
<laughs> there's another um uh, text that's missing so you gotta that's it's it's related to uh, Monique's story again and it was Dr. Joe just saying that decision has to be really really strong so it's uh towards it's the last few pages of chapter eight and he also told us a great story about Buddhist monks from uh, the University of Wisconsin. They did a study. It was a very interesting study. I like this. Um, so basically, the, the monks meditated, and then they measured their brainwaves on an EEG. I'm not sure, actually, if they went into gamma or where they were at, or if it was just alpha or theta. But anyway, they, they were in that Zen space. And then, as an experiment, they sent the Buddhist monks out into the city, where, you know, you've got lots of stimuli and, you know, it's, it can be stressful, right? And um, um, and they exposed them to stress. And then the Buddhist monks came back and then they measured their brainwaves again. And the brainwaves had not changed. They managed to hold on to their Zen. And this is where we want to get to be. You know, yesterday I had a great meditation and then I went to um, the supermarket and um, there was, if you read my blog, there was a, a woman that was had a lot of stress and anger that was behind me. And, you know, I, I it was interesting how chilled I felt. And actually, I was just, I was feeling joyful. And, um, you know, it was fine. There was, it was a really long queue. There was like nine of us, which was crazy. And they weren't opening a second cash register. So she was understandably upset about that. So was I. I, I went looking to see if we could, if a second cash register could be opened. And a woman told me no. And I thought, okay, well, you know, whatever. I'll just stand in the queue and, you know, it's fine. And um, an earlier version of me or a version of me that maybe had not meditated or was in high beta would have been like, this is not acceptable. Nah, nah, nah. And, you know, it's it's like we really have to be guardians we have to guard our state like it is the crown jewels really you've got to you know you are the guardian of your peace and if you notice that you're going into <laughs> that energy that's what causes disease if we're too long in that high beta state it has a stressful effect in our body remember the heart our digestion, um, even, you know, the, our muscles, the physical tension, all of that. So um, we want to stay out of that because we get to choose how we react to circumstances in our lives. And I know we're not the Dalai Lama and sometimes it can be really, really difficult. But the more you meditate and the more that you get into that calm state, the less reactive you're going to be. And it's, it feels very empowering. That's it. That was a long chapter. To summarize chapter eight, and actually this is, uh, you know, this is the end of part two, parts one and two. Now the chapters are shorter and it's more about the practice of meditation. So um, yeah, this is, this is uh, the last big one. So in chapter eight, you learned how your brain changes electromagnetically when you are focused. <laughs> Sorry, a few letters missing there. When you are focused versus when you are, you know, I'm sorry, this is funny. You know why? My, I have misspellings. My daughter did my nails at the weekend. Um, I had a photo shoot yesterday and um, long nails are really interfering with my typing. Like I'm mistyping my passwords and yeah, <laughs> my slides. So you learned how your brain changes electromagnetically when you are focused versus when you are in an aroused state due to stressors in your life. The true purpose of meditation is to get beyond the analytical mind and enter the subconscious mind to make real and permanent changes. You make the real and permanent changes in your subconscious mind and 95% of your life is being controlled by your subconscious mind. You want to get to a place where no outer stimuli, stimuli can move you from the level of energy that you create in meditation. So you want to basically become a monk. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that, um, let me uh, stop sharing. The funny thing is that, you know, people and myself included would like kind of feel sorry for monks, like, oh my God, they have such a boring life. But actually, they're the ones like we're all saying, oh, yeah, you know, let me have the big house, have the big car, have all the money and the great partner and, you know, whatever, you know, all of those external things. And actually, the monks are going, oh, God, poor soul, <laughs> because they're tripping out there in their gamma waves and they're, you know, having that feeling, you know, that beautiful feeling that I got this morning. And I just 
and this morning I was like, okay, I'm really going to try on to, try try hard to hold on to this. But uh, yeah, then when we go into work mode, it's it's. I mean, we I need to um, be in beta for for work mode, but um, taking breaks and just giving those brain waves a chance to experience the coherence and making that your absolute top priority will change your life. I hope this served you. <laughs> That's it. The end of chapter eight. And I'll be back soon with chapter nine.